I think you cannot be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. You cannot be truly fulfilled and happy living someone else's life. The thing that stops us from truly manifesting our greatness and our potential are all the lies that we tell ourselves. The pain is usually some kind of feedback showing you where you're not listening to something deeper inside. I feel surrender is truly the most powerful thing that we can do. I think surrender is the password to freedom. All right, Coop Blackson, welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I am so excited to talk with you about all things about awakening and inspiring people to really unleash and unlock their own inner freedom. And some of the ways that you've done it through your careers with your recent books, your most recent one, 2021, Magic of Surrender. And before that, you are the one. And let's just go ahead and dive into it. Coot, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Amazing. So let's just give a little bit of context, context for the listeners that may not be familiar with your story. I know there's a lot there. I did my own research and <laughs> I would be remiss to leave, to try to encapsulate everything that's gone on in your life or really anyone else's life. So I'd love to hear from you just like high level, high level overview of someone's just meeting you for the first time. Wow. I was born in Ghana, West Africa. Father's Ghanaian, mother's Japanese, grew up in London, now live in the US. So I feel like a citizen of the world from everywhere and nowhere. My entire life has been dedicated to spirituality and understanding the nature of the human experience in some way, shape or form from as young as I can remember. I mean, as a young boy, I always felt a deep, I, I felt people very deeply. I was an empathetic kid. And so there was a part of me that always wanted to alleviate suffering in some way. I didn't know what that would look like. And I, I had a kind of, I, I, I guess that many would say an unusual childhood, but for me, it felt very normal until I got a bit older. And I realized maybe it wasn't as normal as I thought. My first memories as a young boy was seeing, I remember seeing, seeing a crippled woman crawling on the floor and she picks up the sand that this man walked on, wiped on, on her face and stood up and call it a miracle. And so week after week, I grew up seeing blind people see and deaf people hear and people stand up out of wheelchairs. The same man whose sand she picked up would look at a person in a wheelchair and say, why are, you, why are you in this wheelchair? Stand up. Or would, you know, touch the eyes of a person who hadn't seen in a few years and sight was restored. And so this man was my father. He was considered a miracle man of Africa. Built 300 churches in Ghana, West Africa, a huge church in London, hundreds of thousands of followers, maybe at, at his height, possibly a million followers or so in Africa. And a really unique character. And so I was blessed to grow up in this 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 environment where everything was possible, you know? And, and so when I was age eight, my speaking career began and I started speaking in my father's churches and age 14, I was ordained as a minister and age 18, I retired and left everything behind and came to America and pursued my dream. You know, my, my soul called me to the U S specifically California, specifically Southern California, because as a young boy, I was sneaking to my father's bookshelf and read his self-help books, his spiritual books, his, his books from Eastern mystics and Western mystics. And, and so, um, but also people like Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra and Louis Hay. And, and so most of the authors, the modern day authors lived in California. And so my soul guided me to, to come to the U S and go into this field. And I think sometimes what your soul guides you to do isn't always convenient or doesn't always make sense to your mind. But I'm a firm believer that when you really listen to your soul and you listen to its guidance and you're obedient to it, then it will always guide you in the right direction to the right place and the right people, even though the route that you take may not be the one that you most expect. And so I ended up in the US and found many teachers and authors and mentors, studied with some of them, and then ended up traveling to places like Thailand and studied with rabbis, Israel. So Israel studied with rabbis, Thailand studied with some monks, ended up in India. And for me, it was my time in India for a few months, the first time, been back many times since that really cracked me open to a deeper sense of purpose and true nature of my own, my, my own reality. 
and came back to the US and 20 years ago, began coaching people and working with people one-on-one -on -one before coaching was even a thing, before it was really popular and had no idea what the hell I was doing, but uh, evolved my own way of working with people, called it uncoaching. And one mm. person came and another person came and my own method developed and people's lives started transforming and people started coming from around the world. And then it just grew to, to small groups and larger groups and retreats and, you know, long story short, here we are, but I could keep going. But no, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for painting that picture. And yeah, there's no way I could have done that justice. So thank you for telling <laughs> all of us. And it's really, there's so many different threads I could pull at. And one for sure, uncoaching, unconditioning, unlearning, that is so powerful in getting to that inner freedom. And we'll probably go there, but I'd like to start with your relationship with your father and the churches, because you mentioned he had 300 churches and you yeah. were a minister as well. What was it like in not only between your father and you, when you decide to pursue something else outside of, I'm just going to call it organized religion. Yeah. And what did that look, really bring up in you? Yeah. Look, when my father at 14, when my father announced to everybody that my son is taking over, honestly, I knew that this was not my path. I knew that this was not my destiny. It just didn't feel right. And I just didn't have the courage to speak my truth in that moment. I think like many of us, we allow fear to hijack our voice. We allow fear to stop us from sharing our gifts with the world. We allow fear to stop us from being who we truly are. The fear of, if I'm really myself, you won't love me, you, you know? And so I said nothing. For four years, I went through this deep internal conflict from 14 to 18, this inner turmoil kind of depression. And when I turned 18, I knew that my soul was calling me in a different direction. And my father and I, we weren't very close. I loved him profoundly, but we weren't close. He was a very old school kind of guy. And so when I felt this calling to go in a whole different direction, it was terrifying for me. I knew it was true, but it was terrifying because I knew what this would mean to my life. And when I looked into my future, I saw that I could follow the expected path and take over my father's church and you know, live the life that everybody expected me to live. But, and even if I attain success that way, what kind of success is it if I don't have myself, if I don't have my truth? And so I felt the pain of self-betrayal. And I knew that if I start lying to myself now, I'm going to have to lie to myself and my father and everyone else for the rest of my life. And that felt incredibly painful. And so when I had that conversation with my father, it was terrifying. It was scary. It was the scariest thing I had to do. It felt like, it felt like commit, it felt like I was killing my father, you know, and, wow. and there was a tremendous amount of, I was terrified having the conversation. I was, took me four years to, to get over that. I was terrified whilst having the conversation. I was terrified still questioning after having the conversation, even after having the conversation. There was a tremendous amount of grief because I felt like maybe I was betraying my father who I loved so deeply. And so I had to process that. And, and yet I knew that this was the right path, you know, and, and we didn't speak for two years, which was again, very difficult, and very challenging, but you know, I think you cannot be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. You cannot be truly fulfilled and happy living someone else's life. And I knew that I had to, to follow my soul and live my truth, despite the, the consequence and, and the effect in the relationship with my father. And I think it took many years for me to forgive him for what I thought was his lack of support. And it took a few years for him to come to respect my decision, but that, that moment was a profound moment when we reconnected years later, after I finally got to a place of forgiving my father. Um, that moment was the foundation of building a real relationship that was based on truth, not lies. Wow. That there's a lot there. And thank you for sharing that. And I, I haven't gone through anything like that. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And there's, there's something that 
we all experience that to a certain level of degree when we go through our own journey of awakening and finding our inner freedom and pursuing our own truth. And what I'm curious is from experiencing that, what message would you have for people that are currently experiencing that with whether it's a spouse, a loved one, a family member, a close friend, anything at all? Like what, what did you learn from that? That What wisdom can you share with others? The truth will set you free. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. There is no transformation without truth. And I think that the thing that keeps us stuck, the thing that stops us from truly manifesting our greatness and our potential are all the lies that we tell ourselves. As human beings, for so many reasons, we lie to ourselves. Sometimes it's even unconscious, self-protection, self-preservation. Um, and we keep ourselves stuck. We, we stay in relationships, right, that are truly aligned out of safety, out of familiarity, out of comfort, out of guilt, right, out of fear of what will happen. We stay in jobs that we know, again, not truly aligned with our purpose, out of security, out of fear. And so I think that we have to want the truth more than we want what we have. And we have to want the truth more than we want what we think we want. And if you don't deal with the truth now, you will still have to deal with the truth every day of your life. Because the consequence of not acknowledging the truth, the consequence of not living the truth, the consequence of living a lie is what you will have to face every day. And how it manifests is in emotional pain. Lack of energy, lack of inspiration, depression. How it manifests is in physical pain. Neck ache, shoulder ache, back ache. How it manifests is in some ongoing dis-ease. Your unconscious, your body is speaking to you, trying to show you where you're not in alignment. And so I think that in so many ways, when we're not in alignment, when we're not living our truth and we feel pain, it's meant to be painful. The pain is meant to be there. And so if you're in pain in some way, great. The challenge is as human beings, we've been conditioned to distract ourselves, to drink it away, to sex it away, to Netflix it away, to social media it away, to porn it away, to shop it away, to work it away, whatever it is to just don't deal with the pain. But that pain is a signal. The pain is usually some kind of feedback showing you where you're not listening to something deeper inside. And so I think. I would invite people to listen to the pain, to make the pain your friend, to use the pain as feedback and as an opportunity to course correct, to see where am I not in alignment? Where am I not telling myself the truth? Where am I not living my deeper integrity? And bring yourself back into alignment in that way. You know? And so maybe one question to really ask yourself is, okay, what lies am I telling myself? What lies am I telling myself? And just get real, get raw. Sometimes because of the fear of the consequence, we, you know, the ego plays this game of confusion of, I don't know, I'm not sure when deep down we do know, we do have a sense, we have a sense, we have a feeling, we have a intuition, we, we kind of have a sense what's off. And so sometimes the fear of the consequence stops us from really acknowledging the truth. So I would invite people to, 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 to kind of come at it from. Take the pressure off of yourself from having to take any action. Sometimes it's the fear of taking action that kind of blocks us, shuts us down as a self-protective mechanism. And so take the pressure off of, you, off of yourself. You don't have to break up. You don't have to get a divorce. You don't have to leave your job. But just start by acknowledging the truth. You know what? I'm not happy in my relationship. You know what? I'm no longer in love. You know what? I, I actually hate my job. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to take action. But just start by getting into relationship with the truth and feeling how that feels. Because I think that's, that, that, that honesty starts an internal process inside that can go step by step. It doesn't have to just be an explosion all at once. And so I would just invite people to start with the truth and take the pressure off of yourself of having to take action and feel the pain of the misalignment. 
Yeah, thank you for that. There's so many amazing pearls of wisdom in there. And one thing that keeps coming up for me is that that is the art of surrendering. And your recent book, The Magic of Surrender, really like for someone listening, they may hear what you're saying in your story, whether it be with your father or in these examples that they may misconstrue the surrender as in being like, don't listen to that voice and just to surrender to quote unquote, what is, but what you're talking about is so much deeper, like surrender to go. Can you speak to surrender specifically in this situation that we're talking about right now? Yeah. You know, I, I think in our culture, we have so many misconceptions about surrender, myths, misconceptions, misunderstandings, this idea that surrender is weak, that surrender is passive, that surrender is giving up. That surrender is waving the white flag. That if you surrender, you are going to be a doormat. You're going to be taken advantage of. You're going to be left behind. That if you surrender, you won't manifest your goals, dreams, and desires. That if you surrender, you, you're going to get less in life. And I'm actually saying, no, no. If you truly understand the real essence of surrender, which will break down, what if you didn't get less, but you got more? More than you could currently imagine, envision with your current level of understanding, your current consciousness. What if you got more? Maybe not what you expected, but beyond. And so surrender, true surrender is taking the limitations off of life. True surrender requires a willingness to let go of control, or I should say the control that you think you have, that many times control is an illusion and is a master addiction. We think we're in control, but I think if the last few years have shown us anything, you know, starting with COVID, maybe we weren't as in control as we thought. And so surrender is letting go of control. Surrender is when we stop trying to force and manipulate life to fit our limited idea of how we think it should be like this relationship has to be this way. This person has to be the one. This, this, this business has to, this outcome has to be this way. And so surrender is when we sort of stop trying to force things to be something that they're not. Because I, I like to say, trying to force something to be something that is not doesn't make it so. And, and so part of surrender then, as you take the limitations off of life, is the willingness to be open, the willingness to, to be available the willingness to allow life to show you. When we truly surrender and let go, I think that's when the magic can happen. If you look at the really great ones, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, you know, Bob Marley, Mandela, Martin Luther King, at some point, they all surrendered themselves to their purpose, their soul, their highest destiny. They, in that surrender, I think they were able to, to transcend their own human limitations. And that's when life was able to move through them and life was able to use them and life was able to flow through them and manifest through them in miraculous ways. And so I think surrender is, I feel surrender is truly the most powerful thing that we can do. I think surrender is the password to freedom. Surrender is the real seat, the real key to manifesting our goals, dreams, and desires. Absolutely. And surrender is something that I've definitely danced with through plant medicine ceremonies. Ayahuasca, namely the first one that I experienced back in 2019. Is that an area that you've explored working with the medicines at all? You know, I think medicines have a place, you know, in ancient cultures. I think plant well, medicines have their own unique place. It's not something I work with necessarily, and it's not something that I do in my events. You know, I believe that there are ways to access and activate those dimensions and frequencies and energies and states inside of us that we all have it already inside of us. And so I tend to go more the direct route because I believe that inside of us, we are, we are already the medicine. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one thing I'm extremely passionate about is integration. You know, I found in myself some years ago, four years ago or so when I first had my first dance with ayahuasca that it was kind of like this yearning for more and more. And it started off like very much 
about integration and I was good. And then it started to like wander away. It started to go away. So then it was like, oh, let me go to another ceremony. Yep. And then I started to realize, wow, now I'm chasing it, you know? Yeah. And it was like, I truly need to integrate. So I've personally become so passionate about integration of spiritual awakenings with plant medicine or not. And to your point, there are so many other ways to get there. So I'd love to hear from you some of the ways that you would recommend to go about it, to access that state, that frequency. I could go in so many directions, but you know, one thing I really believe is all of life is a spiritual experience. All of life is a sacred experience. And, and so I feel as though we incarnate into this human experience, not to necessarily float into other dimensions but to learn how to be here in this dimension fully, to love here in this dimension fully. And so I actually think that there's nothing extraordinary about what we are. There's nothing extraordinary about being awakened, you know, there's nothing extra. It's actually our natural freaking state. We've just been conditioned out of it in so many ways. And so for me, part of the path of life is how can we make life in every moment and every experience spiritual, sacred, you know? And so that's, that's really what I'm really passionate about these days. I love that. Yeah, me too. For me, it's all about awareness. I think for most of us on this path, but in my process, there is really through the psychotherapy practice of internal family systems and mm -hmm. creating those relationships with the voices and trying my best moment to moment to hear that voice and then step into the kingdom of my inner kingdom, right? And hear yeah. it to the best of my ability. In addition to that, another tactic that works for me is asking the question, how can I feed my soul? You know, whether it's today or in this moment, but when in those times, when we find that we're starting to like veer off the path, it, that's how I come back. What sure. are some tools that you use? Yeah. I mean, I think it's not, it's not so complicated. I mean, for me, it's cultivating, you talk about awareness, it's moment to moment awareness, being present in the moment, being present in my body. I think just simple, simply cultivating a mindfulness and an awareness of breath, a mindfulness and awareness of being in the body and being here right now is a simple way. The, also the opportunity to just observe one's thoughts, you know, and again, it depends on the situation, but the ability to observe one's thoughts, because many times one of the things that I think can throw us off in certain ways uh, are the constant repetitive condition thought processes that we have. We have, you know, 65,000 thoughts a day. And if we're not aware, those thoughts can take us way off course in different directions. And so I think when we start understanding that we are not the thoughts and just because we have a, have a thought doesn't mean it's true, then we can start cultivating a whole different relationship with our thoughts and our thinking. And so just to start observing the thoughts, you know, and just to start questioning one's thinking and questioning one's thoughts, I think is something that people can do. Like, hey, is, is, is this thought true? And just beginning to observe a thought, question a thought is, I think, another simple thing. Yeah, I, I call the process thought tracing, just going deeper layer over layer. And is this, is this me or is this con conditioned state? And yeah, it's a very, very, very powerful exercise. Absolutely. In terms of going back to the magic of surrender, how would you apply this to relationships when you're, say, in an argument with a loved one or something? Mm -hmm. How can you use the magic of surrender to come back together? How can you use the magic of surrender? I don't know. It. I hear your question. Let me just think about the question for a second. I don't know if it's about using the magic of surrender to come back together, but I would just say that part of surrender is the willingness to embrace whatever is arising. Part of surrender is the willingness to embrace whatever emotions are arising. Part of surrender is the willingness to embrace whatever is happening. 
So if you are having a conflict with your partner in a particular moment, part of surrender is to not fight that, like it shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't be feeling that way. I shouldn't be feeling that way. Part of surrender is to embrace like, this is what, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm feeling. This is what my partner's feeling. And this is what is happening. And the willingness to use whatever is happening for one's growth, learning, and evolution, you know? And so, so, so that willingness to not resist what's happening, like this, sh- the, the, the experience that's happening is not the experience that should be happening. I should be having some other experience, but just to embrace it. And then once we are willing to focus on using the experience for our growth and evolution, then I think we're able to learn from the experience and understand, okay, there's an issue. Maybe there's a trigger. Because many times what we're triggered about is not what we're really arguing about or not what we're, what we're really speaking about or not what we're really triggered about, but we can use this as an opportunity to maybe reflect back and, and ask oneself, what is this activating inside of me? How is this situation familiar? What is this triggering inside of me that is unresolved that may have nothing to do with this person, that may have nothing to do with this situation? Because many times we're triggered, you know, we're upset and we think we're upset because of another person. We think we're upset because of what the person is doing. We think we're upset because of what the person has said. And the challenge in a conflict is we often make the other person responsible for how we feel. We often make the other person responsible for our emotional reactivity. And what we then try to do is we often try to control another person to be a different way. We try to get them to be a different way, to speak a different way, to act a different way. We try to control that person to be a different way so that we don't feel upset which keeps us stuck in a, in a cycle. You could say we're not surrendered in that sense. And so part of surrendering is to take the focus off of trying to control the other person because you really can't control the other person and spending your time and energy trying to control the other person. Not only is it futile, but will often lead to a lot of frustration and a lot of stress and anxiety. But as you shift your focus from the other person, you shift your focus to the upset inside. And then allow yourself to acknowledge the upset, not judge the upset, be present with the upset and feel it. You know, I think many times when we're willing to enable just to be present with the feeling and sensation of the trigger that is happening, that feeling and sensation can dissolve in so many ways. And and so I think when we can shift our focus from the other person to ourselves, then we're willing to, then we're able to take responsibility. And that is a first shift. When we take responsibility, then we can focus on dealing with what that trigger is within ourselves and actually resolving that and healing that. And then we may see, shit, this actually has nothing to do with the other person. It's reminding me of a certain situation. It's reminding me of when I was five, when I was 10, with my parents, with my mom, with my dad. So this brings up one of my favorite favorite Ram Dass quotes, which is, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. And okay. for us on the path, it's not so much that we think we're unlight- enlightened, at least I don't, right? And <laughs> maybe, maybe someone does, and that's great, you know, good, good on you. But with being on the path, quote unquote, doing the work and say you're practicing surrender in your own life and you're in this situation, and maybe your partner is or isn't on that path with you. Maybe they are practicing surrender. Maybe they're not. But in that s- certain situation, emotions flare up, whether you're doing the work or not, those emotions still flare up. If you're doing the work, then you have the tools and it's kind of like, okay, it's up to you to access those tools and put them to use, right? Mm-hmm. So if the other person isn't really utilizing the tools, whether or not they have them or not, How can we maintain our center to really, I don't know if this is a question about surrender or just in general, alleviate the the issue and move forward? So that I think is delicate because you're saying if the other person isn't doing the work or or doesn't have the tools. If they do have the tools and are not applying them in that moment, not really mattering if they're doing the work or not. 
Like just because a lot of us, truth is like this happens to myself too. Like when I get triggered, most of the time I'm pretty good, but I do notice those times in reflection like, oh, I could have done better and utilize the tools I had. And I think a lot of us that are especially newer on the path and we do have these tools, like the universe is in a way giving us maybe tests perhaps. Does so, that- so, so I'm hearing what you're saying. I think in relationship, we attract to us a person in a particular moment of our life, in a particular moment of our evolution. Somebody that is perhaps vibrating on a similar level, a similar frequency. And we attract that person because maybe we're moving in a similar direction and there is maybe karma or there are certain lessons that we in that person have to resolve, unfold, work through together. And on some level, that person is a mirror manifestation of your consciousness. That person is a mirror manifestation of an aspect of your consciousness. That person is a mirror manifestation of a part of yourself reflecting to you a part of yourself or parts of yourself that you need to make peace with, integrate, heal, let go of, you know, forgive, you know, embrace. They're reflecting something to you. And so I think when we really see that, then then you see on some level, really is no relationship out there. It looks like there's a relationship out there with this person, but we are in relationship with aspects of ourselves in the form of this person. And so I think that even if we're in a conflict and, well, they're not doing this and they're not doing that, nah, 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 nah. I mean, maybe it's true, maybe, maybe it's not true. But ultimately, regardless if it's true or not, the truth is you, me, when I say you, us, you have attracted that person to you and they're showing you something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in relationship with them. So I think the, mo- the more quickly we can not just make it about the other person and bring ourselves into that responsibility and own the projection of what they're showing us, own the projection of what they're mirroring to us or not mirroring to us, the sooner we are able to heal ourselves. Because when we heal ourselves, then either, when we heal ourselves, then either that person will shift or either our reaction to that person will shift, which will then cause them to shift. Well, either our reaction to that person will shift and they stay the same and it keeps happening and they stay the same and eventually the mirror will no longer align and we might start to then gravitate into a different frequency, energy, vibration as we no longer match anymore. And we may graduate and move on. And so I think we attract people into our lives because we're vibrating at a similar level with similar frequencies, with similar lessons. And we attract each other because there's perhaps certain lessons that we have to teach each other. And I think when we heal ourselves, doing the mental, the emotional, psychological, spiritual work, and we learn those lessons, that's when we will begin to graduate from that dynamic, either with the person or without the person. That's powerful. That's really powerful. And this is everything we're like, talking. Let, let me give you an example. Okay, thank I, you. I, I remember like I, well, almost 20 years ago, I was in a relationship with a woman, beautiful woman. I thought I was going to marry her. I think it's fair to say that this is not my projection, that, that she was a, a bit jealous, okay? And I don't know if you've been with a woman that's jealous, but she was, was really jealous. I mean, to the point where I'd be in a room with another woman and it would turn into an argument. I, I didn't even look, I didn't even, I didn't even do anything. I was just breathing. And, and, and so when I would look in, the, in, in another woman's direction, it became an argument for days. When I wouldn't look in, in another woman's direction, it became another argument for days. Like, why are you not looking? Why are you trying so hard to not look? So I couldn't win either way. And I thought, this is insanity. And honestly, for three and a half, four years, this became a conflict. 
this became an issue. She was trying to change me and I was trying to change myself. I was trying to change her. We were fighting constant. It was like three years of hell, basically. But I loved her and we loved each other. And this is what love was. Until I realized, wait a second, I say I don't want this experience. And I say, I don't want to be with someone that's jealous in this way. And I say, but, but somehow I've attracted her. Mm-hmm. So kind of long story short, I broke up with this woman, manifested another woman. Was she jealous? Hell yes. Not as jealous as the other one, but jealous again. Broke up another woman. Was she jealous? Similar energy, similar frequency, slightly different dial, slightly different, you know, volume. But the frequency and the energy was there. Eventually, I had to say, you know what? Maybe it's not about these women. What is it inside of me that keeps attracting this or actually wants this? My logical mind was saying, I don't fucking want this experience. This is not what I want. I hate this. But when I I really stepped back and I really questioned and I said, I will keep attracting the same energetic frequency unless I shift or heal something in myself, there is something inside of me that keeps either attracting this kind of woman or attracting this energy out of whatever woman I'm with. It's one of those two. Because if there's something that's unresolved inside of you, it will stay stay as an energetic crystallized vibration that will Pull that person to you or pull it out of someone. So when I started to say, you know what? There's something in me that I'm not looking at, that I don't want to look at, that I don't want to see. What is it that I don't want to see? And so this is a key question we can ask ourselves. What is it that I don't want to see? And many times we don't want to see it because the ego is getting something out of that dynamic. What I had to acknowledge, cut a long story short, was I wanted to be with women that were jealous because when they were jealous in a very unconscious way, it made me feel safe. It made me feel validated because that little boy inside of me that was afraid of not being loved and afraid of being abandoned felt validated in that moment because if someone was so jealous, they sure as hell were going to abandon me. And, and, and so there was this unconscious wound of my own fear of abandonment that you could say was, was pulling in a certain energy of a woman that was so attached that fed perfectly into a dysfunction. And, and so when I really owned my own fear, my own inadequacy, my own insecurity, and began to be honest about that, number one, then began to heal by bringing loving, healing, compassion to that inner child. And as I started healing that, that shifted my own energy, that shifted my own vibration, that shifted my own internal self-confidence, that shifted my, 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 my own, you could say, frequency that then allowed me to bring in a whole different energetic of feminine into my life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm thinking about it as in like, that would be the process then part that you described, like how to move past karmic debts, essentially. Sure, sure. And yeah. and closed loops. <clears throat> wow, this has been so powerful. There's so many great nuggets here. I'm so stoked that we had the opportunity to connect and just want to be mindful of your time and to keep these podcasts a little bit shorter and easier to consume. But Coot, this is awesome. I'm so stoked. Please let the listeners know where they can find you online. Sure. My book, The Magic of Surrender, is available on Amazon. Check it out there, the paperback version. My website, Coot, K-U-T-E, Blackson.com. People can find out as much info there. Twice a year, I do an event in Bali. I'm doing my final two Bali events this year, July the 28th. Uh, and December the 5th. So the next event is July the 28th in Bali's 12 days. We dive deep. W, boundless, bliss, Bali.com. If someone's listening to this and they're feeling ready to transform and go to that next level, join me for 12 days in Bali. That sounds incredible. And you've been doing that for 20 years, right? No, 10 years. 
10 years. Okay. I don't know why I had the number 20, but that's absolutely incredible. 10 years to go to Bali twice a year. Twice a year. Oh man, that's amazing. I'm going to check out that link myself just to make sure I have the link correct. Is it boundlessblissbali.com? Boundlessblissbali.com. Okay, cool. Guys, all of the links that Coot just mentioned are going to be, they are in the show notes. So just go ahead and wherever you're listening to, just check out the show notes and you can click it from there. And Coot, thank you again for coming on the pod. So great to connect with you.